Thank you. Senator Brown, it being 2 p.m., we will go to questions without notice, and I call Senator Gallagher. Oh, God, I nearly had a heart. To the Minister representing the Minister for Government and Services, Senator Rushton. In question time yesterday, the Minister claimed that, and I quote, as soon as we became aware that the method of debt collection was not valid, the Morrison government, quote, immediately ceased the robo-debt scheme. When did the government first become aware that the Honourable Scott Morrison's robo-debt scheme was not valid? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Gallagher. Um, I'll have to take on notice the exact dates so that I can give you the exact dates. Well, Senator, I'll take the interjection from Senator Wong. Senator Wong, um, that I, I do not keep my diary with me. However, I can I can stand by the comments. You are asking me for a specific date. That date. I, I will take on notice and I will provide that date to the chamber of, uh, of the exact date that I became aware that the method by which we were uh, determining uh, debts through the income compliance program was not valid. Oh, I think Senator Rustin has concluded her answer. Um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and my uh, supplementary is on what date did the government first seek legal advice, on what date was the government first advised robo-debt was not valid? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I, I'm assuming they're two separate questions in relation to legal advice and the date at which we were advised that income compliance um, and uh, uh, income matching uh, was not a valid means by, by which uh, by which, and I will stand by uh, the assurance that I gave to the chamber, and I have taken on notice the exact date, and I will provide back that back to the chamber at my soonest convenience. In relation to, well, as soon as I have, as soon as I have had the opportunity, Senator Wong, as soon as I have the opportunity to find the exact date, I was not asked yesterday for the exact date. Uh, I would also like to put on the record, despite those interjecting opposite, in relation to legal advice. As is the normal practice, um, Senator Gallagher, the practice that you undertook when you were in government, um, we do not provide advice in relation to legal advice. It is a long-standing practice of this chamber and the other chamber of successive governments. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question did not go to the content. It went to the date on which legal advice was sought. Um, I think the minister was, has the minister concluded her answer. There was only there was three seconds remaining. She has. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rushton claims the government was, and I quote, very, very quick and responsive. When the government stubbornly persisted with the program in spite of 76 warnings from the AAT between 2017 and 2019 and losing hundreds of appeals, why should Australians believe this minister? Senator Rushton. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and I stand by the comments that I made yesterday, Senator to Gallagher, and, and I said I'll provide you with that advice. And once again, I would point out, as I did yesterday, each and every case that goes before the AAT is a unique case. Some of those cases found in one direction, some of the cases found uh, an alternative outcome. So to come in here and suggest that, that the outcomes of an AAT form the basis of legal advice to government, I think, is a misrepresentation of what the AAT process actually does. But uh, as I said yesterday, um, as soon as uh, the government was aware that income compliance was uh, the program was not collecting or determining its debts on a valid basis, which was income matching, we acted very quickly, and I stand by that. We acted very quickly to cease that program and put in place a program to enable the repayment of those debts. Order. Before I come to you, Senator Antich, I'd just like to acknowledge in. Order. Before we move to the next question, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge members of the ADF Parliamentary Exchange Program who are joining us in the Senate Gallery today. Uh, welcome to Parliament House, and I hope you find your experience here valuable on behalf of the Senate. <laughs> Senator Antich. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting small and medium businesses to keep apprentices in training through the economic impacts of COVID-19 and how the government is delivering on these commitments to ensure Australia has the skilled workforce it needs to build a stronger and more secure post-pandemic Australia? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Antic for his question. And as Senator Antic knows, the Prime Minister has made it very clear. Australia's economic recovery from COVID-19 will be a skills-led recovery. And that is why, as a government, we have put vocational education and training at the forefront of our economic agenda. Order. And in fact, Mr President, this year alone, this year alone, we will invest almost seven billion dollars in vocational education and training. That's right, almost seven billion dollars. Mr President, when COVID-19 first impacted us earlier this year, the government understood that trainees and apprentices they are the first to go in an economic downturn and we needed to put in place the policies to ensure that employers and in particular our small businesses were able to keep their apprentices and trainees on the job where we need them. And we did this through our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. It commenced in April this year and it runs through until March next year. And Senator Antic, as at the 27th of November 2020, the wage subsidy has now assisted 56,000 businesses, 98 per cent, Mr President, of which are small businesses in Australia, to keep now over 103,000 apprentices and trainees on the job, and we do this by covering 50 per cent of their wages. Mr President, this now includes over 20,000 bricklayers they have been kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 15,000 electricians kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 10,000 plumbers kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. 5,000 hairdressers again kept on the job because of the wage subsidy. And 8,000 automotive mechanics and electricians. And for those from rural and regional Australia, over 35,000 of the apprentices and trainees and over 20,500 small and medium businesses Order. have utilised the wage subsidy. Cash. Time for the answers expired. Order. Order. Senator Antich, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will the government's job trainer fund build on this success to support out-of-work Australians to undertake training, fuel skills shortages and find employment following the economic in impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, access to free or low-cost training in areas of skills demand is so important as Australians in our economy recover from the impacts of COVID-19. And that's why, as you know, the government has partnered with the states and territories, all of the states and territories. The Commonwealth Government has put half a billion dollars on the table, and the states and territories have matched this funding with another half a billion dollars, and we have the $1 billion job trainer fund. As you know, all states and territories, in fact now including your home state of Victoria, have signed on to the Job Trainer Fund. The fund itself, once up and running, will provide around over 300,000 additional training places. And in fact, in six jurisdictions, Senator Keneally, it is now live. In six jurisdictions, it's now live with over 263 thousand additional training places. They are already available and on the market. Free or low-cost training in areas of actual Order. demand. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Minister, as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19, how will the government's job maker budget build on the record of skills reform and support new apprentices into training? Senator Cash. Mr President, as I noted in my first answer, we put in place the supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy because we recognise that small businesses in particular impacted COVID-19 needed assistance to keep the apprentices and trainees they had in training on the job. But we also recognise as a government that we need to assist businesses to bring on new apprentices and trainees to ensure that employers have the pipeline of skilled workers that they need. And that's why we've announced a $1.2 billion boosting apprenticeship commencement subsidy. That, Mr President, will create 100,000 
new apprentices and trainees. And what it does is really highlight the importance of skills and training uh, to Australia's economic recovery. The subsidy, again, it's available to employers of any size, in any region, uh, in any location, to sign up a new apprentice or trainee and claim up to 50 per cent of their wages through till the 30th of September next Order, year. Order, Senator Cash. We are going to Senator Billick remotely. We'll just give it a second to kick in for her to ask her question. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with a Disability found the Morrison government's failures led to it, and I quote, neglecting to develop policies specifically addressing the needs of people with disability. Why? Um, there was trouble hearing you there, Senator Billick. Um, uh, if I could ask another Labor senator to read it, um, that would be handy. Thank you. Senator Wong? If you don't mind, Senator Billick, we had um, some difficulty hearing, so I might just repeat it. Um, the COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability found the Morrison government's failures led to it, and I quote, neglecting to develop policies specifically addressing the needs of people with disability. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong on behalf of Senator Billick for reading out the question. Uh, Mr President, as uh, the government has said, we have welcomed the release of the Disability Royal Commission's interim report. Uh, we acknowledge that we all have a role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation of people with a disability. It is completely unacceptable. We also thank Senator Billick, the Disability Royal Commission, for its important work, and we will carefully consider the findings in relation to COVID-19, as well as other issues and recommendations that emerge as part of this inquiry. The government is committed to ensuring our response to the global pandemic properly takes into account the needs of people with disability, and we will carefully consider all of the recommendations as part of this process. I can also advise that the Australian government will work across relevant portfolios and ministers to respond to the Commission's recommendations as a matter of priority. Now, I'll go to Senator Billick again and I'll ask the controllers to see if they can max up the volume. Um, Senator Billick. Thank you. Disability Royal Commission Chair Ronald Sackville was clear in identifying that the federal government was responsible, and I quote, it was the absence of that consultation that led to significant failures in the responses of the Australian government. Why was the Morrison government willing to leave Australians with a disability behind? Senator Cash. Well, as Senator Billick, I'm going to uh, reject the premise of the way in which you've put the question, and you'd be aware that the government has consulted widely uh, in relation to this. But again, the Australian government, we Order. welcome, Mr President, Order. the interim report of the Disability Royal Commission. And as I've also said, we will now work across portfolios and across ministers to respond to the Commission's recommendations as a matter of priority. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The report found the Morrison government failed to provide PPE to people with disability and their support workers, failed to provide access to essential food and medications, and left people with disability feeling forgotten and ignored. Why does the Morrison government keep leaving vulnerable Australians behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Mr President, in relation to the premise of your question, uh, I will again reject it. And as I've said, we Order. have welcomed the interim report of the Disability Royal Commission. And again, as I've already stated, Mr President, one of our most important tasks during the course of COVID-19 has been protecting people with disability. And as we have also stated, we all have a role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation of people with disability. The government has acted swiftly and decisively to help protect Australians with disability in response to the involving impact of COVID-19. And as I've said, we will now work across portfolio and across ministers in relation to the recommendations. Senator Faruqi. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to the leader of the government, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Today, former president of Kiribati, Anote Tong, has written in the Sydney Morning Herald highlighting the climate change remains the single most pressing security threat to their region. He says that without radical action, deadly disasters will become more intense and severe. Kiribati will become uninhabitable and there will be a wider global apocalyptic disaster. He calls for serious action on climate, including moratoriums on coal and gas. In this piece, Mr. Tong has asked our Prime Minister if he is now willing to listen to his specific family and take steps to protect all of us, and said that courage and leadership are what's needed here. Will the Prime Minister have the courage to listen and act on the climate crisis? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Faruqi for her question regarding the, uh, the uh, media comments of the former Prime Minister of Kiribati. Uh, I, uh, I note the comments. I haven't read the uh, opinion piece in full, but I have heard some commentary in relation to it, and, uh, and obviously uh, you have quoted from it to a degree, Senator Faruqi. Uh, what, I, uh, what I would say in that regard is that uh, our government certainly takes our engagement with the Pacific Island family uh, of nations uh, very, very uh, carefully and importantly in terms of the approach we take, including on issues of climate change that we know uh, are of very real and genuine concern uh, to our Pacific Island family. Uh, it is why uh, we have taken every possible step to ensure that as a country uh, we, time and time again, when we make commitments in relation to emissions reductions, meet those commitments and exceed those commitments. Uh, it's why, unlike some other nations, we haven't sought to outsource activities in relation uh, to the meeting of those commitments either. Uh, indeed, yesterday, I think, when I gave some figures in to, uh, to Senator Waters uh, about um, Australia's rate of emissions reduction uh, relative to other countries that have not achieved uh, comparable rates, uh, those countries, generally speaking, when it comes to meeting their Kyoto 1 or Kyoto 2 obligations, uh, rely upon international credits purchased elsewhere to be able to offset uh, the emissions within their own country. In Australia, what we have been able to do through our uh, work over many years uh, and through the technological change and investments that have occurred across the Australian economy uh, is to be able to meet and exceed the targets that we have set. Uh, and it's through that continued investment in relation to technology uh, that we will continue and to be able to meet and exceed our targets, to build upon those targets, but to do so in a way that also protects Australian jobs and indeed job opportunities for the many Pacific Island workers who come and enjoy opportunities Order. in Australia Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, in an open letter to the Prime Minister published today, 15 Pacific leaders, including Mr Tong, describe their homelands and cultures as facing certain devastation from climate change. Does the government acknowledge that the worst impacts of climate change are being felt and will continue to be felt in poorer countries, including many in the Pacific region? Senator Birmingham. As Mr President, well, the government does, uh, does certainly uh, acknowledge uh, the severity that Pacific Islanders uh, see in relation to climate change issues, and it's why uh, we engage very seriously and thoughtfully with them on those issues. It's also why uh, we believe that the first responsibility for a country like Australia in making commitments as we have in relation to emissions reduction is to meet those commitments, indeed to strive to exceed those commitments, uh, and why we are pleased that Australia has consistently done that, uh, unlike some others. We also acknowledge that it is therefore then a global responsibility uh, that you don't get uh, outcomes in terms of emissions reduction that Pacific Island leaders may wish to see unless other nations also not only make commitments but then also deliver on those commitments. And the delivery is a key part that seems to often be put aside in the virtue signalling aspects of some of this debate. For our government, we see delivery as essential, and that's where our focus is when it comes to emissions Order. reduction. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, amongst the calls in this open letter are for new and additional funding beyond the current aid budget to finance climate mitigation and adaptation under the Paris Agreement, including contributing to the Green Climate Fund. Will the government commit to this? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. 
Yes, Mr President, uh, well, our government has put great priority in terms of uh, delivering specific assistance and support to Pacific Island nations, and we see that as important across uh, a range of different areas of policy import. Climate change, adaptation and resilience is one of those, uh, and we support work with our Pacific Island family uh, in that regard. Uh, equally, we have scaled up support for Pacific Island nations in response to COVID uh, and delivered additional support focused very directly in terms of uh, the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and there, in building on that COVID support in a financial sense, has also been our acknowledgement of our responsibility in working with those less developed nations, those smaller micro nations within our region uh, for their access to vaccines and to ensure their safety and their economic wellbeing. So we take the responsibility in working with those nations across all of those areas and other development considerations very, very seriously. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister outline how the Australian government has responded to the threat of COVID-19 to senior Australians in aged care? Order. 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 Senator Wong. Senator Wong, that is not helpful before the ministers started answering a question. Senator Wong, interjections are always disorderly. Um, I, before we be disorderly, I'd like to at least hear from the minister. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you to Senator Henderson for your question. Uh, Mr President, from the very beginning, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic has been a top priority for this government. We know that our most vulnerable senior Australians were at most at risk, and we have acted at every stage to prepare Order. for a worst-case scenario. Should this virus enter our aged care facilities, Mr. President, we closed our Order. borders, Mr. President. We planned for an emergency response with our medical professionals. We negotiated hospital agreements. Order we increased the left. capacity of our providers, and we resourced a surge workforce for residential aged care. We secured and distributed a substantial national stockpile of PPE, all at a time of global shortage, Mr. President. We have invested to date over $1.7 billion to plan, prepare, act and recover, Mr. President. There are no countries, Mr. President, where there has been widespread community transmission that have been able to avoid outbreaks in residential aged care. Here in Australia, we've seen the devastating loss of 693 Australians, Mr. President, in aged care. Our condolences will always be with their friends and families, Mr. President. When community outbreaks occurred and COVID-19 hit Victoria and New South Wales, we came together with a collaborative response between fate, federal government agencies, state governments, providers, professionals, families and senior Australians, hospital networks and others to do what we could to manage the outbreaks, to keep it out of the homes of our most vulnerable. As I noted yesterday, Mr President, in our response to the Royal Commission, we've been able to stop the spread of COVID-19 to senior Australians in 97 per cent of Senator our aged Colbeck. care facilities. Order, Senator Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. What is the government Order. doing to ensure— Order. Senator Polly. Senator Polly. I'd like to hear the question, please. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator Colbeck, what is the government doing to ensure COVID-19 is kept out of aged care facilities into the future? Yeah. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. It's, it's very pleasing to Order. note, Mr President, that there have been no cases of residents in aged care since the 28th of October, Mr President. While the rest of the world continues to battle this terrible virus, we mostly have it under control here in Australia and now have the capacity to recover in time and get on the front foot so that we are ready for any future threats. Mr President, the government accepted and is acting on all six recommendations from the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19, and yesterday I announced an additional $132.2 million of measures 
to help our senior Australians to ensure we even, are even stronger into the future as we recover. We are committed Mr. President, to strengthening infection prevention control in facilities, including working with state jurisdictions to do so. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister provide a comparison of Australia's aged care response compared to the rest of the world? Order. I'll call. I'll, I'll, order. So I'll, I'll wait till there's silence, Senator Colbeck. We're wasting time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I outlined to the Senate yesterday, one of the leading geriatricians in Australia's response to fight COVID-19, Associate Professor Michael Murray, said Australia was as well prepared for a significant aged care outbreak as any country or jurisdiction in the world, Order. with the probable exception of Hong Kong. Senator Keneally. Mr. President, we have learnt the lessons Senator from Rennick. Hong Kong, including Senator the adoption Watt. of their model of infection control leads in each of our facilities. Globally, Mr. President, the impact of COVID-19 has tragically been felt in aged care. Ha Australia has had fewer deaths, both in total and in care homes, than many other countries in the world, including those that we know are going through a second wave of infections. Senator Urquhart, order. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Last night, the Morrison government tabled its formal response to the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19. The document failed to state that 685 older Australians died from COVID-19 in the Morrison government's residential aged care system. Why? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I quite clearly stated in my statement to the Senate yesterday afternoon Order. Uh, that 693 Australians have died as a result of COVID-19 in respect of COVID-19. Uh, it's an absolute tragedy in every single circumstance, and I've just repeated that a moment ago myself, Mr President. The response that we tabled yesterday to, was to the measures that were requested by the Royal Commission, and it was our response to the Royal Commission report, Mr. President. That's what we tabled yesterday. And in my statement yesterday to this chamber, I acknowledged, as order. I have done Senator, on many Senator occasions, Colbeck, I've got Senator Urquhart on a point of order. Senator Urquhart. Point of order is relevance. Um, the minister was asked why the document failed to state that 685 older Australians had died from COVID-19. I'd like that question answered. Wait, I've allowed you to restate the question there, Senator Urquhart. While the minister is talking about the number you referred to and the content of the report, I can't instruct him to answer a question in that form. I think he is being directly relevant to that, but I've allowed you to restate it and remind him of it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I'm not interested in the political games that the Labor Party seek to play with respect to this issue. As I've said order, a moment ago. Order, Senator as Col I've said order, Senator Order. I'll call se Senator Senators on my left. Senator Wong is on her feet. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. Uh, we asked you why your report did not include a reference to 685 Australians who died in your system. I would ask you to have the decency to respond to that. Senator Birmingham on the point of order. Mr President, on the point of order, Senator Colbeck has been consistently directly relevant in his response to this question. Senator Colbeck, in responding to this question, has ide indeed identified this was a government response to the specific recommendations of the Royal Commission. He has equally identified that in tabling that response in the statement made, the number that was referenced was cited. I fail to see how a senator could be any clearer and any more Order. relevant, directly relevant in responding to an answer than Senator Colbeck is being. I Order. Senator Wong, your point of order was substantively the same to Senator Urquhart's. I allowed you as leader to make the point again uh, and to restate uh, that concluding part of the question. Um, Senator Colbeck, in my view, while he is talking about the report that was tabled and while he is talking about the number, 
um, of Australians who have passed away um, due to this. I don't, I don't think I can instruct him as to how to answer a question that specifically. He is being directly relevant to the question at the moment. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, the, the report that I tabled yesterday responded directly to the recommendations of the Royal Commission's COVID-19 special report. In my statement that I gave in tabling that document, I directly referenced, I directly referenced all of those, all of the 693 who have passed away as a result of COVID-19 in aged care. 685 in residential aged care, eight in home care. Uh, and acknowledged again, as I have done on many occasions in this chamber, the individual tragedy it is for each of those families and their friends and communities. And we continue to work in the interests of all senior Australians in aged care in responding to the virus uh, and managing its effects in the community, Mr President. Uh, this government, as I have outlined a moment ago, since the outbreak of the COVID-19, has been working closely with the aged care sector to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have continued to develop our plan as that process has Order. continued. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, the minister tabled the annual report of the Aged Care Act. Again, the report failed to state that 685 older Australians had died from COVID-19 in the Morrison government's residential aged care system. Why? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, that report directly referenced the impact that COVID-19 had had on senior Australians. And putting a date at a point in time, when that number— when, Order. When, 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 well, I'll take, I'll take Senator Keneally's, Senator, I'll take Senator Senator Keneally's Keneally. interjection, because the date of the report was at the 30th of Senator June Watt. last year, and at that point in time, the date of the number of deaths had changed. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Senator Mr. Keneally. President, uh, the number Keneally. of deaths continued to escalate through July, August, and September. Uh, through into October, when until the 28th of October, we got to the fantastic circumstance where there are no cases of COVID-19 in residents in aged care in this country, because Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia, and the T T Tasmania and the territories have managed to control the community transmission of the virus. And when there is community transmission of COVID-19, there is a risk to residential aged care. Order, Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Today in the Senate Gallery, we have nurses who have been at the front lines of this pandemic and cared for older Australians in this minister's broken aged care system. What will it take for the Morrison government to stop denying the 685 deaths on its watch, to take responsibility and to ensure that this never happens again? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And can I completely Senator reject Keneally. the premise of the question? Because at no point in time have we had to, not, to had, have we denied at no point in time have we denied the tragic circumstances of COVID-19 in aged care. And it's quite dishonest, Senator, for you to actually frame your question in that way, Mr. President. Can I say? I pay tribute and give thanks to every aged care worker, not just the nurses, the personal care workers, the therapists, everybody who has worked on the front line in aged care. And thank Order. you for being here today, Mr. President. I, I pay tribute to everyone. And while this opposition at the last Senator election Keneally. refused to give any additional resource to staff in residential aged care, Mr. President, we have on three occasions provided additional resources and payment to staff in residential aged care in the form of retention payments, Mr. President. This government is Order, the only one Senator who's Colbeck. actually in Time material for your terms has recognised. Expired. Order on my left. Order. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. My question, uh, turning from aged care to health care, is for the minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberals and Nationals in government are building our investment in regional and rural Australia through the 2020-21 budget to ensure that our regions 
have access to the most effective health care possible. The Minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey Order. for her question. And I acknowledge, like all of us on the government side of the chamber, her commitment to Australians who reside in rural and regional Australia, but in particular also to our commitment as a Liberal National Government to improving the health standards of those who reside in rural and regional Australia. And in fact, Mr President, in this year's budget, regional Australians will actually get benefit from improved access to health services, and that's because we are, have invested a $1.2 billion investment to booth health care in the bush. And Mr President, this significant investment, $1.2 billion investment, it builds on the reforms that the government has already put in place to expand, as we know, rural training opportunities, but also to address the complex workforce challenges that actually occur in rural communities. Mr President, in terms of the focus uh, of our reforms. They are focusing very much on addressing the distribution challenge, um, and we are now investing in new approaches and localised solutions. Uh, we understand as a government that one size uh, does not fit all, and in particular when you look at a country that is the size of Australia. So, In terms of the investment and the policies that we are putting in place, we are very much breaking new ground by investing in unique sub-regional models of primary care delivery. We're trialling different approaches uh, to addressing the unique challenges to regional health care. Uh, Mr President, these regional models, as I've said, they move beyond the one-size-fits-all approach. And what we're looking at doing is empowering local communities with the tools to integrate the services that they already have, to increase their support in essential services, but also to find localised solutions. And in addition to that, we have a $3.3 million investment that is actually going to support the delivery of the primary care across five sub-regions, as Senator Order. Davey knows, Senator Cash, in New South Senator Wales. Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. And to support this initiative, how is the government securing better training for rural GPs, which makes rural health practice more appealing to our regional medical practitioners? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, again, the government understands that rolling out health policies that are uniform across regional Australia, it hasn't always worked. When you have a country the size of Australia, one size fits all is not always the way to go. So what we're looking at doing as a government is we're looking at drilling down into more innovative and collaborative ways of supporting our regional health workforce. Um, and as Senator Davey would know, evidence shows that when students actually undertake their training uh, in the regions, they are more likely to stay in the regions. And that's why, in terms of the funding that we've provided in the 2020-2021 budget, we're providing an additional $50.3 million to enhance the rural training pipeline through the long-standing rural health multidisciplinary training program. Mr President, we understand that providing the funding to ensure that we can extend training into smaller rural communities and rural residential aged care facilities will assist Order, those Senator in Cash. rural and regional Senator Australia. Davey, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you. Um, finally, as we emerge from this pandemic, and thankfully there hasn't been much of an outbreak in the regions, but how is the government continuing to support our regional communities and our regional health systems to remain alert to the risks of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, I think we all acknowledge that we all need to remain alert uh, in relation to COVID-19. And certainly, though, uh, whilst cases in rural and regional Australia and rural and regional communities uh, remain relatively low, it is important that we do remain vigilant, uh, but also be ready to respond in the event that there is transmission in any part of our regional communities. And again, in terms of the recent budget, the 2020-2021 budget. Importantly, it continues to fund the government's COVID-19 health response to manage the impact of the pandemic in rural Australia. Uh, Mr President, in terms of some of the policies that we have implemented, we've fast-tracked, as you know, the expansion of temporary MBS telehealth items, including for rural and remote Australians. Uh, and in fact, Senator Davey would be pleased to know that there have now been over 10 million telehealth services delivered to more than 3.2 million people in regional Australia. Uh, and that Order, is why the Senator Cash. Senator Lambie. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Yesterday it was announced that the former Liberal Premier of Tasmania, Will Hodgman, would be Australia's next High Commissioner for Singapore. Mr Hodgman replaces Bruce Gosper, the former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Mr Gosper replaced Philip Green, the first Assistant Secretary in DFAT's International Security Division. Mr Green replaced Doug Chester, Deputy Secretary of Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade. And Mr Chester replaced Miles Cooper, the former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. Mr Cooper replaced Gary Quinlan, the former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. And Mr Quinlan replaced Murray McLean, former Deputy Secretary of DFAT. So I'd like to know, Minister, did you run out of DFAT Deputy Secretaries or is the Liberal Party just a deeper talent pool these days? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I am very pleased to acknowledge the strong service of former High Commissioners for Singapore that uh, Senator Lambie has been kind enough to read into the Hansard record. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, if I may say particularly, uh, Mr President, uh, if I may acknowledge uh, Mr Bruce Gosper, the incumbent High Commissioner in Singapore, he and his team have been doing an exceptional job in the context of the COVID-19 challenge in particular including supporting my most recent visit to Singapore, which is one of the very few international visits that uh, we have been able to make as a government in the context of COVID-19. I would say, uh, Mr President, in response to, uh, to Senator Lambie's question, uh, which, uh, which uh, notwithstanding her uh, humour, I will uh, assume goes to the appointment of the former Premier of Tasmania, Mr Will Hodgman, that Mr Hodgman is a highly, highly qualified very appropriate appointment to be Australia's High Commissioner in Singapore. One of our most important regional partners, key Order. member of ASEAN, a country which, with whom we have a very important strategic partnership, Senator, a digital engagement that, uh, that, uh, that is uh, one of the most significant that Australia uh, has undertaken in recent years. And what, Premier, for, what former Premier Hodgman and old habits die hard, I still call Arthur Sinodin a senator, what former Premier Hodgman will bring to this role is a, uh, is a view of Australia as a, as a uh, key partner in the Indo Pacific, particularly in ASEAN and particularly with Singapore. He is well known for putting Tasmania in particular on the world stage putting Australia first in everything that he did, everything that he has done, and he is eminently well qualified. I look forward to working with him into the future Order as he leads left. Australia's representation Order. in Singapore. It will be welcomed by Prime Minister Lee and it will be welcomed by Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishnan. It is a recognition Order. of Senator the important Payne, relationship time for the answer we have with has Singapore. Expired. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Lambie, I'll, I'll wait till I can hear your question. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm glad you mentioned that Will Hodgman was highly qualified. So, if he's so highly qualified, what was the selection process you followed for his appointment? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, uh, Senator Lambie, the government has a range of... Uh, a range of... Order. Order. Order on my left. I'm going to ask people to take a breath after I call for order before they start being disorderly again. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Let me say that uh, Mr Hodgman has extensive experience across key sectors of importance to, to the uh, Australia-Singapore relationship, particularly trade and tourism. Uh, he will be an outstanding advocate of Australia's interests in Singapore and an outstanding advocate for our engagement through Singapore and with ASEAN in particular. He will, he will complement the extensive work done by the incumbent, Mr Gosper, who, as I said, has been a fine High Commissioner uh, in Singapore and continues to be so. Uh, it is important to note that Mr Gosper does not include his term uh, until uh, January of next year. When our ambassadors and our High order. Commissioners— Senator, um, Payne, Senator Lambie on a point of order. Uh, sorry, um, Mr President, I'm just wondering. Um, I did ask what the selection process was. I haven't quite got to that yet. You reminded the minister of, of, of the question. She has, well, I, I thought four seconds, eight seconds according to the clerk. Um, Senator Payne, have you concluded your answer or you'd like to? Yes, Senator, Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Besides being a job for a mate, what professional personal relationship does Mr. Hodgman have with Singapore that could possibly qualify him for this role? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I think it is important for uh, for. Uh, Senator Lambie and for uh, those opposite, it would seem, from the uh, cacophony uh, opposite, um, to really appreciate the importance that we place on growing our relationship in priority areas, continuing our nations, Australia's and Singapore's work together in responding to in the, particularly the health and the economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Hodgman's extensive experience in government, his extensive experience in trade and in tourism, Just which are key aspects of our— Senator Payne, I have Senator Lambie on a point of order. Um, Mr President, I'm simply asking what professional personal relationship did Mr Hodgman have with Singapore that could possibly qualify him? I just want to know what professional person relationships Senator, he had to qualify Senator him for Lambie, that. Senator Lambie, I think with respect, um, order. Senator Payne is being directly relevant. She's answering the question, if not necessarily in the form requested. Um, she is being directly relevant to the question. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I have spoken to um, Mr Hodgman's particular expertise as an outstanding leader of government in Australia, an outstanding leader of government who really moved Tasmania into a place on not just the Australian stage but the world stage in trade and tourism terms, uh, which, which those opposite may wish to decry and which Senator Lambie may not accept, but with, with, but which this government, Mr. President, sees Order. as Senator Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that as early as the 8th of March 2017, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal held that no debt could be founded? on the basis of a robo-debt letter. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. No, I can't. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Will, will the Minister commit to taking that question on notice and providing us with an answer? Sen is that the sub I, I can't instruct the Minister. You've got... No, well, Senator O'Neill, um, the Minister's concluded her answer. You have an opportunity now to ask a supplementary question. Senator O'Neill. Can the minister confirm that, in addition to the decision handed down on the 8th of March 2017, the AAT held that the robo-debt scheme was illegal on a further 75 occasions? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, as I have said on a number of occasions in this place, um, the AAT plays a very important role in um, making decisions and providing independent merits review to a wide range of different uh, decisions. Um, but in doing so, I would note that each case is unique and turns on its own facts and circumstances. And in the situation, Order. there have been decisions of the AAT um, that have uphold, um, upheld. Uh, the debt decisions calculated using income averaging, and equally there have been those that have not. Um, and what I would say is that you cannot unilaterally come in here and make a, a determination on the basis of a specific case and make a general, a general assumption that the Order. decisions that are made on particular cases, and as I said, some of the cases before the AAT, some of the unique and individual cases before the AAT um, have been found not to have been upheld, and others have been upheld. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Hasn't the Morrison government known for years that the robo-debt scheme was illegal? Yes. Yes. Senator Rustin. No. Yes. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on how the development of the Greenvale Training Centre training area is boosting jobs in North Queensland and helping to build a stronger and more secure Australia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for that question. The Morrison government is resolutely committed to supporting Australian jobs and boosting the economy during COVID-19. And I'm so proud that defence is significantly contributing to this economic recovery. 
Since the beginning of COVID-19, we've been working with Australian industry to progress defence projects uh, to both deliver essential defence capability and also to provide much-needed cash flow uh, throughout our economy. And I'm pleased to, uh, to announce to the Senate that we are proceeding with all of the scheduled work under the $2.25 billion Australian-Singapore Military Training Initiative. Last month, I was delighted to announce that the Australian company, CPB Contractors, have been awarded a contract for works on the new defence training area in North Queensland. This $800 million investment near Greenvale will create long-term local jobs and support local industry in North Queensland. The construction workforce is expected to peak at 350, with 90 per cent of the workers drawn from the local area. This advanced new training area will provide significant long-term local economic opportunities for North Queensland and particularly Townsville. When the Australia-Singapore Military Training in Initiative reaches maturity, up to 14,000 Singapore Armed Forces personnel will train in Queensland for 18 weeks a year. This will provide enduring economic and social benefits uh, to Queensland for at least the next 25 years. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the economic and local industry benefits the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative will deliver in central Queensland? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, in addition to Greenvale, the Morrison government is further investing in the Shoalwater Bay training area in central Queensland. Together, both of these investments in north and central Queensland coincide very happily with the 30th anniversary of Singapore Armed Forces training right here in Australia. This $2.25 billion Australian-Singapore military training initiative will meet the future needs of both our own Australian Defence Forces and also the Singapore Armed Forces. And as part of this initiative, we're investing $800 million into the central Queensland Capricorn region. The Shoalwater Bay investment will support 47 local companies and 450 workers at the peak of construction. This is further evidence that Queenslanders can trust the Morrison government to bolster regional growth and also to support local jobs. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. How does the development of this training area benefit the ADF and our key bilateral relationships with Singapore? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President. Singapore is a highly capable and very, very close defence partner of Australia, with a shared commitment to regional security and also to stability. In October, I made my second official visit to Singapore, where I met with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Lee, and also my defence counterpart, Dr Ung. It was very, very clear to me during this visit how much Singapore values its deep engagement with Australia, particularly so this year in our 30th anniversary of Singaporean training here in Australia. And they appreciate this relationship just as much as Australia does. As close and enduring defence partners, these training areas support our interoperability right across the Indo-Pacific. And it also ensures Singapore's ability to generate a force that provides strategic weight in the region. As Australian-owned and managed training areas, they also support a more Order. capable Senator and Reynolds, agile time ADF. The answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to a Minister Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the Australian public, indeed the world, has been shocked by allegations of war crimes, criminality and human rights violations committed by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. And can I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Defence Force personnel in here that I'm sure few people have been more shocked than them at these allegations. Does the Minister agree that the Australian community has a right to know about such things? Does the Minister agree that the victims of these alleged crimes have a right to the truth being told? In short, does the Minister agree that these allegations being, being made public is a good thing. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Wish-Wilson for his question. And let me too uh, acknowledge the 
serving men and women of our Australian Defence Forces who are in the gallery today and say to all of you, thank you for your service and thank you indeed for the contribution you make to our nation. And I extend that around this chamber to the various colleagues who are veterans of the Australian Defence Forces and thank all of them as I do any of those listening for their service and contribution. Uh, and in doing so, it is crucially important when we uh, discuss matters of the IGADF report that first and foremost we acknowledge the vast and overwhelming majority of the men and women who have served Australia's Defence Forces with distinction and with honour. And in doing so, we say to all of them that you should be proud of your service and that we are proud of you and what you have contributed. And part of the pride that Australians should take in the way we conduct ourselves as a nation and our defence forces operate is that we hold ourselves to a high standard. We hold ourselves to a high standard as a country and to all those who go out under the flag of our country and serve under that flag. That we expect in doing so they operate with the type of distinction that the vast, vast majority have done so. But in holding ourselves to that high standard, we also apply a degree of accountability and transparency that is unmatched by many other nations of the world and unruly. It has ensured the measure of accountability is in place and it has been transparent through the release of the findings in the summary report of the IGADF. Order. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. The Burton report made strong recommendations about protecting whistleblowers in bringing information on war crimes to light. Indeed, it recommended uh, not only protecting them, uh, but also uh, promoting them. David McBride is the only whistleblower facing criminal charges and a potential lengthy jail sentence in relation to these disclosures that the Australian public now have. Minister, will your government rule out the prosecution of Army lawyer and whistleblower David Order, McBride? Order, Senator Rich Wilson. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, and the government is indeed grateful for the cooperation of many in relation to uh, the conduct of this inquiry, uh, and we have responded uh, in relation to this inquiry uh, by establishing the office of the special investigator uh, to handle matters that relate to potential criminal conduct and to investigate those and to ensure that proper judicial processes, including presumption of innocence, are followed quite appropriately. Uh, we have equally put in place an implementation oversight panel to review Defence's response to the recommendations into the report to ensure that in doing so there is, again, appropriate accountability to the leaders of the Australian Defence Force as they respond to order. this report. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Senator point of relevance, President. Will you rule out prosecuting whistleblower David Senator McBride, Wish Wilson, Minister? Um, again, um, that was the conclusion of your question. Um, the preamble forms part of the question and a minister can be directly relevant addressing part of a question. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I'm not in this chamber going to make decisions uh, from a political pulpit that are rightly the matters of proper legal processes. Senator Rich Wilson, a final supplementary question. So I'll take that as a no, Minister. Um, along with David McBride, your government has aggressively pursued lawyer Bernard Caleri and witness K, and has demonstrated a chilling complicity in the extradition trial and political witch hunt of Walkley Award winning Australian journalist Julian Assange. Minister, why is your government waging a war against whistleblowers and transparency? Order. Now, 
Senator Wish Wilson, I have sought some advice from the clerk. The substantive question at the commencement was about another matter. The second supplementary needs to be relevant to the substantive question, not just the second question. So I'm going to allow the minister to address assertions made because I don't want to have a situation where questions can be asked and then ministers not have the opportunity to address them, even though questions might be ruled out of order. But I encourage people to make sure both their follow-ups are, are follow are within the standing orders with respect to the substantive question. Senator Birmingham. Or Senator Wish Wilson. Point of order. I'm happy to talk to you about this afterwards. Are you actually ruling my question out of order? Uh, no. Well, my, my, my practice on this form, Senator Wish Wilson, um, I'm happy to speak to you afterwards. Um, my practice on this is that I am reluctant to rule questions out of order because I do, uh, so that ministers don't have a chance to respond because, quite frankly, I don't want to create an incentive for misbehaviour in questions that then cannot be addressed in the chamber by assertions being made and then preventing ministers respond to them. So I'm urging all senators, and in this case Senator Wilson, saying this question I think could be ruled out of order, but I'm allowing the minister to respond to it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I will make three observations in response to Senator Wish Wilson's attempted supplementary question. Number one is uh, that I will not, on such a sensitive issue, seek to politicise it in any way, unlike the Australian Greens. Number two is that I will not, as a politician Order. or a minister, seek to overturn what are appropriately the decisions of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution or those in whom Order. such authority to make Order. legal determinations is vested. And number three, I would note again, Mr President, that our country has held itself to a standard of accountability and transparency on this highly sensitive matter, the likes of which I struggle to think of any other nation holding itself to. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Oh, Senator Pratt. Oh. Aged care and senior Australians. Senator Colbeck. In August, the minister promised that he was requiring residential aged care facilities to, and I quote, have a designated infection control officer on site. In the government's response to the Royal Commission's special report on COVID-19, it's revealed the practitioners the minister promised in August will only be in place today. Why has it taken three months for the minister to deliver this protection for older Australians in aged care and support aged care workers? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, uh, Senator, Senator Pratt is correct. On the 31st of August, we announced that we would require all aged care providers in this country to have a nominated IPC lead within each facility, Mr. President. Uh, and just because we say it doesn't mean it magically happens, we had to give the sector the time for it to occur. And so, Mr. President, I wrote, I wrote to all aged care providers, Mr. President, I wrote to every aged care provider in this country and told them that they were required to nominate their infection control lead by the 1st of December, Mr. President. And that's why, what I expected they will have done, Mr. President. So, uh, we, in fact, moved ahead of the Royal Commission on this particular issue by announcing at the end of August that we would require every aged care facility in this country to nominate an infection control lead. We gave them a reasonable period of time for them to get that position in place. Uh, and we have, Mr President, given them a further period of time to ensure that they that this uh, nominated staff member has the appropriate level of qualification, Mr. President, and we've actually nominated the qualifications that they will be required to have by a certain date, Mr. President. So we have actually done exactly what we said we would do in August. We said to the sector we would be requiring them to nominate the lead, Mr. President. We have made it a condition of their. Uh, accreditation, so they are required to do it, Mr. President. And so we've done exactly everything that we said we would do, and we gave the sector an appropriate period of time to get that position in place. Senator Pratt, supplementary question. Can the minister guarantee that, as of today, the 1st of December, every residential aged care facility has appointed an infection prevention and control clinical lead? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as, as I've just advised the, the chamber, Mr. President, uh, I have made that 
appointment a condition, a condition of accreditation, Mr. President. So, as each residential aged care facility is checked for its accreditation, and we are conducting uh, 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 checks on infection control on aged care facilities all over the country. We have been doing that for a period of time, and we will continue to do that because this is not just a set and forget process, it's a continuous improvement process that we've asked the providers to put in place. So this will be and is a, a, a requirement, Mr President, of their accreditation. So that fact will be checked as a part of that process. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Given the Minister's management of the Morrison government's broken aged care system, which continues to be characterised by dawdle and delay, isn't it clear that this minister has learned nothing from the tragedy he's overseen, the almost 700 deaths in aged care from COVID-19 and the censure of the Senate? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the senator uh, suffers from not having listened to the previous answers in asking the second supplementary, Mr President, Order. because I have directly addressed every single issue that uh, Senator Pratt has raised. Uh, we've done exactly what we said we would do in the time that we said, and we've in fact made the appointment of the infection control professionals a factor of accreditation of aged care to ensure that we continue to improve the system and keep our senior, senior Australians safe, Mr President. Senator Birmingham. I will now ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cash and Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Billick, Pratt and myself. So here we have a minister who, while a pandemic raised, raged through our country and took a terrible toll, most particularly on the most vulnerable, on residents in our aged care facilities, was incapable of taking a decisive and timely uh, actions to meet the government's responsibilities to this sector. He gave every impression of not being on top of his brief and freezing on the job. From his answers today, I have no more confidence in his abilities or the ability of this government that he's part of to manage or respond to serious infectious outbreaks and pandemics uh, in aged care residential facilities. This pandemic has taken the lives of 685 residents of these government uh, facilities, leaving thousands grieving the loss of partners, husbands, wives, parents, grandparents and great-grandparents, and dear, often long life, uh, lifelong friends. It's been left in the wake of traumatised residents and traumatised staff. 685 Australians dead. These are our loved ones. These are those who cared for us, loved us and deserve better. Better care from their government and better respect for the contribution that they've made to our country. They deserve act action and they deserved a government with a plan. They deserved a federal minister who could move fast, who could lead. And at very, very least, they deserved a mention a mention, an apology, even in the government's response to this Royal Commission special report. But what did they get? A response from this minister no faster than a glacier moves. A lumbering government in denial, constantly, constantly trying to deflect and deny responsibility, constantly saying it had a plan and failing to show anything for it. I've looked through the government's uh, response to the Aged Care Royal Commission special report into COVID-19. I've listened to this minister attempt to answer the questions that I put to him in the chamber here today, and I heard nothing, nothing but self and yesterday when he was here talking to that document, I heard nothing but self-congratulation, slippery words and hubris, the same self-congratulation and hubris that the Royal Commission itself criticised. Minister Colbeck, the truth is that your response and the response of the miserable, careless government you are a part of has been totally inadequate, glacially slow and massively disrespectful to the lives of 685 Australians and their loved ones. 
The truth is that you are now only putting into effect actions that you should have taken in March and April. When infections tore through the aged care facilities in Europe, this government should have taken action then. When the first COVID-19 infections occurred in, occurred in New South Wales, the government then should have taken action. It's December now. That was March, and to date, 685 Australians have died. They didn't get a mention from this government in the response to the Aged Care Royal Commission special report into COVID-19. And even now, by your own admission, you've, been, you've had no way of monitoring or knowing how effective the response has been of this government. I point to you recommendation six, that the Australian government should require providers to appoint infection control officers and should arrange for the deployment of accredited infection prevention and control experts into residential aged care. Here we are, December the 1st, and the, pro and the response is that that's in progress. Infection control surely, surely should have been the number one priority of this government back in March. In August, the government promised residential aged care facilities would have, and I quote, a designated infection control officer on site. And here we are in December, and the minister can't tell us whether they've been appointed, how many experts, and how much training has been done. It's in progress, you say. That's not good enough. In fact, it's pathetic. And a great many Australians have be suffered because it's, it's not good enough. The government is not good enough, and it's a sham. For many months, months, the minister's been saying that the government has a plan for aged care. And what do we find now in December, except at a recommendation that you have a plan for aged care? It beggars belief. And it leaves us quite sure that we are right to be fearful and angry, because if this government can't respond in an effective and timely manner to a pandemic, then imagine how hopeless it's going to be to the response to the Thank final you, report. Senator Urke, your time has expired. Senator Sasselger. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to what is a very important issue. Um, and of course, it's an issue that this government treats uh, with the utmost seriousness uh, and urgency and gravity. And one of the reasons that the Prime Minister, one of his first actions uh, upon becoming Prime Minister, uh, was to call a Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. Uh, this is a government that takes these responsibilities seriously, and there's a minister who takes those responsibilities seriously. And uh, when we heard just just then uh, the contribution from Senator Urquhart, uh, somehow claiming that Minister Colbeck uh, doesn't care, uh, or that in fact that his answer did anything other than respond uh, to those serious issues, I think is a complete misrepresentation, a complete misrepresentation uh, of this minister. Uh, and of the work that he has been doing uh, and, in fact, of the answers uh, that he was giving uh, in question time to uh, some of the Labor Party's uh, questions that have been put to him. Um, I, I do want to go through, I do want to go through um, uh, some of the responses uh, to the report um, and just to point out that the Labor Party, despite uh, all of its, all of its uh, promised tax hikes at the last election, couldn't bring itself to promise one extra dollar uh, when it came to aged care uh, in this country. Despite $387 billion of new taxes, uh, there was not one dollar uh, to show its priorities in this space. But uh, when it comes to the response, uh, the Australian government accepted all six recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's Aged Care and COVID-19, a special report. Uh, the, and in response to the recommendation four of the Royal Commission's report, the government has updated the National COVID-19 Aged Care Plan to its seventh edition in consultation with the AHPPC Aged Care Advisory Group. The national plan sets out uh, how the government has and will continue to support the aged care sector to prevent, prepare, respond and recover from COVID-19. It also provides links to guidance, information and tools to support aged care recipients, their families, the aged care workforce and providers of aged care services. Uh, the revised plan builds on and consolidates the critical and successful work already undertaken by the Commonwealth Government and allows flexibility to manage 
individual situations in each state and territory. It represents the seventh stage of national aged care planning. Uh, other measures uh, which have been announced include that aged care residents will now be eligible to receive up to 20 individual psychological services in line with the services available to the broader community. They will also uh, be eligible for double the allied health sessions under Medicare chronic disease management plan. In addition uh, to the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the government is also funding group allied health sessions for residents in, uh, in facilities affected by COVID-19 outbreaks, including people who need rehabilitation after recovering from COVID-19 and people who have lost condition or mobility because of restrictions put in place to manage the outbreak. A range of actions have been undertaken uh, by the Australian government to ensure the right balance can be struck between restricting visitation in residential aged care facilities where necessary, but ensuring residents are nice, not isolated and lonely during these difficult times. Uh, so this is a government uh, that takes these issues seriously and is, is carefully uh, responding uh, to these recommendations. Uh, but uh, I would make this point in terms of the Labor Party's attacks, uh, and we saw it again today in question time. Uh, they seem to suggest uh, that even though uh, the deaths that we have seen, the tragic deaths, which the minister again acknowledged uh, in his answers today, which wasn't acknowledged by those opposite, uh, those tragic deaths have occurred almost overwhelmingly uh, in the state of Victoria. And the Labor Party seeks to deny that for rank political opportunism and for rank political purposes, to try and ignore the fact uh, that virtually all of the deaths were happening in Victoria as a result of the huge outbreak as a result of the Victorian Labor government. Well, you're running a protection racket for the Victorian Labor government. We take this issue seriously, but by pretending, by pretending there is no issue to Order. see in Victoria and it has nothing to do with the massive Order. community outbreak caused by the Victorian Labor government, demonstrates you, your Senator motives Sir in this Sir, space. Your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise this afternoon to also take note of answers given to questions by uh, Senator Colbeck and Senator Cash. And it is indeed uh, a greatly disturbing event uh, that in the Royal Commission's report that's been handed down in relation to the treatment of people with disability uh, under the COVID-19 arrangements, or should I say lack of arrangements. The Royal Commission Chair Ronald Sackville has found the government was responsible for a serious failure in its communications uh, with Australians with disability. The report noted it was the absence of consultation that led to significant failures in the responses of the Australian government. It is the most basic and fundamental tasks uh, of this government, of any government, to undertake consultation with those affected in any time of change or need, especially uh, <coughs> those who might be vulnerable uh, to those circumstances. We have seen in this time People with disability left stranded at home without meals, without being able to wash, without being able to move themselves in order to prevent bed sores, without being able to take required medication and get required support. Now, it was entirely predictable and obvious that these kinds of scenarios were likely to occur. Entirely predictable. We know that disability care workers often need to uh, work across a number of households of people with disability, and we also know they're poorly paid. We also know that those workers had their own fears and concerns at the height of COVID about uh, their own susceptibility uh, to uh, catching COVID and their own caring responsibilities. So it was little 
of surprise to no one that disability support workers uh, fell away and that many people with disability were totally without their basic care needs being met. What we also saw was because of the suspension, uh, because of the lockdowns, we also saw the usual recreational and other outing activities also suspended. And that again meant people with disability were left further isolated and alone. Australians with disability have been treated as an absolute afterthought by this government in this pandemic. These outcomes for people with disability were entirely predictable. Not only were they entirely predictable, but people with disability were picking up the phone. They certainly called my office uh, to ask for help and support, and I'm sure they would have been calling yours as well. These Australians should have been our first and top priority not to be treated as an afterthought. We also saw an appalling lack of personal protective equipment available to disability care workers. What did this mean? This means that care workers were also afraid for their own health and for spreading uh, COVID-19 to their own families. What did that mean? It meant in that climate of fear, many of them didn't take their shifts and didn't go to work. In many instances, because they're on casual contracts, on casual employment, frankly, they weren't required to. If you were permanent part-time or permanent full-time, then it's a requirement of your job uh, that you go to work or that you call in sick or take personal leave. But in these circumstances, where you've got high numbers of workers who are concerned for their own wellbeing and safety uh, and on casual contracts, it was absolutely inevitable that these workers were going to feel also vulnerable. But this government, this government- Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired, Senator MacDonald. Thank you. I find it extraordinary that I'm going to respond to these matters taken note by the Labor Party, who once again is acting as if the actions of this government could have been um, taken as if we had the benefit of 2020 hindsight, as if it was um, completely predictable, as if this wasn't the greatest pandemic that, hadn't hit, that had hit the world in the last hundred years and with the sanctimonious glow of being able to see what has happened, now want to lecture the government on what could have happened and what should have happened. Because when you're in a position of responsibility and in government, you have to make the difficult decisions in difficult times without the benefit of hindsight and 2020 vision. Uh, but the government has at all times acknowledged the um, and express sincere sympathy to those affected by the pandemic and our deepest condolences to those who have lost loved ones. And every time the minister stands up, he acknowledges the 693 people in aged care who have lost their lives. As one of the few people in this place who've actually had uh, COVID-19, I understand the, um, the fear of having the test, of having it come back as positive and then wondering to see what the impacts will be on you. And my heart goes out to all of those people who have not only been in that situation, but have then had contact with people who are the most vulnerable and at risk in our society. And I know the terrible t uh, price that they will have paid to be in that situation. Um, this government has prioritised the introduction of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to provide additional protection for aged care residents, with an additional funding of $11.1 .1 million, <coughs> taking the government's total investment in the scheme to $67.2 million. Now, our response to the Royal Commission's report and updated plan highlights our ongoing commitment to improving care for senior Australians and keeping them safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. The government has now funded more than $1.7 billion in aged care-specific measures 
to support the plan. And this investment directly addresses issues raised by the Aged Care Royal Commission and will improve and support the health and wellbeing of aged care residents most significantly impacted by COVID-19. And it must be noted that whenever there are high rates of community transmission, the risk to older people, and particularly those in residential aged care, increases, and we need to remain vigilant. The government will continue to work closely with aged care providers and all states and territories to ensure the ongoing safety and care of senior Australians. Because most tragically, it was in the state of Victoria where the hotel quarantine provisions were found and are still subject to inquiry, found to be desperately, desperately inadequate and failed not only the people of Victoria, not only the people of Australia, but most tragically, uh, those most vulnerable and at risk in our society, our elderly um, people. And they have paid a terrible price for that government's uh, response. And I'm sure that they too wish that they had uh, this federal opposition's incredible hindsight, incredible 2020 vision to now know exactly what could have possibly been done differently. But as I've said already, this government uh, is acting at all times to protect and, uh, and take care of those people, in, particularly in aged care. The government has accepted and is acting on all six recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, as previously announced last month in October 2020. The Morrison government will invest a further $132.2 million in its response to the Aged Care's Royal Commission's recommendation on COVID-19. This government has also updated its aged care plan. It's been developed in close consultation with the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee's Aged Care Advisory Group, which has been made permanent, meeting another recommendation of the Royal Commission's report. And the Minister has said on many occasions how carefully he has consulted, how carefully he has listened and taken into account the recommendations and views not only of that group but others right across Australia who also care about the aged in our community. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Pulley. Too little, too late. That's the reality of the actions or the lack of actions earlier by the Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, and this government. Let's put things into context, shall we? Of the 685 older Australians who died during the pandemic, we have the government now, the senator just explaining to the chamber how it's all the Victorian government's fault. It's amazing how it's okay to shift the blame but for this government not to accept responsibility for their failings over, not since March this year, by neglecting older Australians and some of the most vulnerable Australians in this country, but in fact it's been seven years and I've lost count how many ministers there's been for aged care. But I was talking to a colleague and I said, you know, who do you think has been the worst aged care minister in this country in the last seven years? And in fact, names came to mind like Ken Wyatt, Susan Lay, uh, Greg Hunt, Mitch Fifield. But I think we all agreed in our discussion that it is this current minister who has failed older Australians. He's been censured by this uh, chamber. And what we've seen now is it's not only the 685 older Australians that have died, but it's the impact on their families, their loved ones. But during this pandemic, it's not only those who have lost their lives, but it's been the staff who have had the responsibility for caring for them, that they have not been supported by this government. Not only were they not provided with the adequate PPE and the support that they needed being on the front line. But we know this government has neglected them also for the last seven years, not ensuring that they were adequately resourced. They certainly don't get paid uh, the remuneration that they deserve. And what we've seen is just cuts 
And why should we expect anything different from the Prime Minister when, in fact, he cut almost $2 billion when he was Treasurer out of aged care and used this sector as an ATM? So the public have no confidence in this minister. They have no more confidence in him than what we do on this side of the chamber, because we know, after the countless reports that have outlined very clearly, with days and days of evidence given to various committees and various inquiries into the aged care sector trying to get to the bottom of why this system is so broken and to give forward to the government of the day solutions for how they can do their job better by providing the support to older Australians that they deserve. But what have we got? Absolutely no response at all from this government. Then what we saw was them bringing in uh, and, well, calling for a royal commission into the aged care sector after they'd been in government for a number of years and failed to address the concerns, having collected somewhere between 12 and 16 different reports into the failings of the aged care sector and the struggle that a lot of the providers themselves are having uh, to keep their heads above water. But what, what we haven't seen is any leadership from this government. We've got a minister who, quite frankly, is no more interested than when they first in, came into government and we saw Senator Fifield uh, take on that responsibility. And the only thing he was ever interested in was the arts, certainly not in older Australians. And we've seen no improvement over the seven years that they've been in government. But what we have seen now, finally, is the spotlight has been shone on the aged care sector in this country because of the Royal Commission, because of this government's failing. The media now has some interest in aged care, but this is the opportunity for this government to finally address all those concerns that the community has had, all the uh, recommendations from uh, those countless reports that are being put forward, and to finally do something so that those 685 older, vulnerable Australians in the aged care sector who die because of the failings of this government to provide the leadership and support that was needed uh, in this sector to have not died in vain. To not have died in vain. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. So the question is that um, do you take note of the questions put by uh, Senator Urquhart. To answers provided by the government. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the Minister's response to my question on the climate crisis, our Pacific neighbours and Australia honouring its climate um, commitments. Which Minister, Senator Faruqi? Uh, Minister Birmingham. Thank you. The climate crisis looms large in the landscape of global inequality. Those who have contributed least to the warming of the planet amongst the poorest communities on Earth will experience the worst of the climate catastrophe. Today, 15 Pacific Islander leaders published an open letter to the Prime Minister of Australia. They described their homelands and cultures as facing certain devastation from climate change. They call on Australia to honour its international climate commitments and take urgent action to combat the climate crisis. Today, former president of Kiribati, Ahnote Tong, has also written in the Sydney Morning Herald, saying that without radical climate action, deadly disasters will become more intense and severe. Kiribati will become uninhabitable, and there will be a wider global apocalyptic disaster. He calls for serious action on climate, including moratoriums on coal and gas. Amongst their calls are for new and additional funds for the Australian foreign aid budget to finance climate change mitigation and adaptation. Climate justice must be central to Australia's foreign aid program. The global north, including Australia, is responsible for the overwhelming majority of excess carbon emissions causing the climate crisis. The relentless pursuit of profit and power by wealthy colonial countries and multinational corporations has put the world on track for a global temperature rise of at least 3.4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The climate crisis and global poverty are the results of colonialism, 
structural inequalities, and grossly unfair trade and debt systems. These systems can't be fixed. These systems have to be torn down. That also means totally reconfiguring the way we think about international aid in this country. The provision of international aid should not be approached as a way of geopolitical positioning or exerting our self-interest. Nor can it be thought of as kindness or charity on the part of wealthy nations. That wealth was stolen through exploitation, slavery, and genocide. And wealth continues to be stolen. The provision of aid must be about justice and about repaying what is owed for the crimes of the past and present. The story of the industrialization of the global north is one of violence, exploitation, and extraction. This wealth was built with the resources and labor of the colonized peoples. Australia has a bloody British colonial history and continues to perpetuate its own colonial projects. Last year, it was estimated that Australia siphoned off more money in oil revenue from Timor-Leste than it provided in aid, and more than Timor-Leste spends on health in a year. Our Pacific neighbors are paying the heavy price of Australia's absolute refusal to tackle the climate crisis. Communities face rising sea levels, the annual destruction caused by tropical storms, the loss of arable land and drinking water, and the enormous social and economic challenges of displacement due to the climate crisis. The injustices of slavery, colonialism, and imperialism do not just lie in the past. They are ongoing and fundamentally affect communities' capacities to survive this impending disaster. Unaddressed, the imbalance of wealth and resources across communities will result in a, in a climate apartheid as the poor bear the brunt and the rich can afford to evade the worst. Given Australia's role in producing vast amounts of climate changing pollution, we have a particular responsibility to compensate and work with affected communities to avoid a total climate meltdown. Australia must look at its history and the way we tell our histories. When we listen to our Pacific neighbors, we need to hear them. We have a heavy responsibility to take strong climate action, to help communities manage and survive the climate crisis. We must increase our aid budget and cancel the burden of debt. We must turn the focus of aid from Australia's narrowly defined national interest to climate reparations, resilience, and justice, and to undo imperialism and colonialism. Our neighbors are asking us to show courage and leadership, and we must. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The aye.